Good morning from Washington, D.C. My name is Dr. Anwar Bukars, and I am a professor of counterterrorism um, and counter violent extremism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I'm also the faculty lead of this virtual uh, academic program, developing local strategies to counter the violent extremism. Uh, this is a joint program that the Africa Center for Strategic Studies is convening <coughs> with the African Union uh, Center for the Study uh, and Research on Terrorism, CAIR. So I want to extend a very um, warm welcome to the many distinguished colleagues and friends who have joined us uh, uh, today in this virtual <clears throat> academic program. And with that, I want to welcome uh, Dan Hampton, the acting director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies to make some remarks. Dan. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bukhars. And uh, let me join you in <clears throat> offering a warm welcome to everyone who is with us today on this uh, virtual event. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're connecting from. And thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. As Dr. Bukhars mentioned, uh, my name is Daniel Hampton. I am the acting director here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I really appreciate you all taking the time to participate in this event with us, this important event in this important topic. I know we're interacting in this virtual environment due to COVID, which I know that we're all ready to move on from and it's wearing us down. Uh, we give up a little when we engage virtually, we know that, but we're going to do our best to uh, create some relationships and some partnerships and hopefully even some friendships even though we're connected virtually as we interact here over the next several weeks. And by several weeks, again, thank you so much for your commitment and taking the time uh, to be with us and join us in, in this event, which uh, due to the virtual nature of it, it, it does spread out a little longer than if we were in person. And just rest assured, uh, we're committed to uh, coming back and doing in-person programming. As soon as we can safely do that, we will. It's the highest priority for us here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Let me take a quick minute for those who may be new or not familiar with uh, the Africa Center and who we are and what we do. So we were established and funded by our Congress in 1999 for the study of security issues relating to Africa and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. Our mission is to advance African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. And how we achieve that mission is through three organizational pillars, three pillars within the Africa Center. The first is our academic affairs section, conducting events such as today with the seminar that uh, Dr. Bukars has organized and that you all are participating in. The second is our research and strategic communication section. And if you haven't been to our website already, I highly encourage you to go and become familiar and make it just part of your routine to go to our website. It's africacenter.org. And on our website, we have copies of all our research publications uh, downloadable in PDF format. Uh, all of them in English and French, and many of them in Portuguese, some in Arabic. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Bukars mentioned, uh, we have uh, recordings, uh, video recordings of sessions that we've done from previous events and programs. So just a wealth of information on our website. So I highly encourage you to become familiar with it and use it as a resource for you. That's what we have it for there. It's to advance our mission. It's one of our pillars. So I encourage you to become familiar with it and use it. And our last pillar is our uh, community alumni affairs and our outreach. And that's really our connection with you. We hope your engagement with us today is not just about this event. Uh, we hope it's, it's lifelong and, and it's part of a valuable part of your career. And we wanna stay connected with you. Uh, we want it to be beneficial for you and beneficial for us because we stay connected to the continent and understand what is important to African security sector practitioners like yourselves through the interaction and dialogue and the relationships that we have with our alumni. So again, thank you and we welcome you as part of the Africa Center family. And if you remember in the mission statement, the last sentence I read was, 
that we catalyze strategic solutions. And that's really where you come in. It's really about your solutions and your strategies and your policy. We approach these events in a peer learning model so that everyone shares with each other because you're the experts. You're out there every day. You're working, living the African security sector, African security challenges. You know these best. So we tee up the issues. We provide some evidence-based analysis. We moderate, we facilitate the dialogue, but really it's all about you. And we take that important. And that's why Dr. Bukhar has mentioned that this is non-attribution. We don't attribute the names or countries. We wanna create that trusted platform so that you all can share and come up and catalyze those strategic solutions to tackle these intransient security issues and challenges that we see persist on the continent. So we're partners with you in that. And finally, again, thank you for joining us. Now it's my pleasure to actually introduce our partner in this event. And as Dr. Bukhar mentioned, it's with KIRT, which is the African Union's Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism. And we have with us today, Mr. Idris Lalali, and he's the acting director and head of the Alert and Prevention Unit at KIRT. Among his primary responsibilities are leading the design and development of the center's counterterrorism early warning system and manage a team of analysts that conduct policy analysis and studies on terrorism in Africa. And currently, Mr. Lalali is leading a team of experts that evaluate the counterterrorism capacity of African Union member states. So it's really with great pleasure that we get to partner again with Kyre, a sister institution with us. And Idris, thank you very much for joining us this morning and this afternoon and being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dan. It's a, a real pleasure indeed to be partnering again with uh, ACSS on such a uh, an exciting program, and we're very delighted that this uh, program is uh, our first activity that's kickstarting 2022. And uh, as you uh, correctly indicated, I think we're looking forward to have uh, a program at least in this year or throughout this year some in-person meetings. At least we get to uh, touch base with our uh, participants, stakeholders and be able to connect with them because it's been uh, quite some time uh, where, uh, you know, we uh, did not meet uh, in person. Uh, allow me also to join you in offering our well, uh, warm welcome uh, to all participants and to thank them for uh, being part of this uh, uh, program, uh, which um, is a continuation uh, to um, what we started a couple of years ago in terms of assisting member states in developing PCVE strategies. Uh, we started with regions and we bring it down to the member states. We're quite excited to have such a diverse community of participants. And I'm sure the discussions, the interactions are going to be very informative from our end and will guide our future work um, that we will undergo um, jointly in the future within the framework of, uh, of these programs. Uh, also, I, I um, I'm very grateful for this continued commitment that ACSS has shown to the African Union through its continued engagement uh, individually with member states, with regional economic communities, and with the continental organizations. Um, CAIRT indeed has evolved this relationship since 2005. It was uh, in October 2005 where we had our first activity with ACSS, and we're very grateful that this relationship continues to evolve and get stronger. Um, year in and year out, and we look forward to uh, increased interaction uh, between our experts, uh, but also in organizing uh, events that respond to member states' expectations and member states' uh, needs. Uh, indeed, the African Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism was also launched uh, short of 18 years ago uh, to respond to uh, uh, the specific needs of assisting member states in developing the counterterrorism. Uh, capacity, uh, but also to provide policy orientation and guidance to the political organs of, of the African Union. And uh, as I said, uh, one of our missions also is to build partnership beyond the continent, uh, facing um, requirements, uh, you know, uh, against a multinational, uh, multinational threat, which is terrorism and violent extremism. So partnerships such as the one that we have with ACSS is quite useful because it brings to the table and brings to uh, the participants, the expertise and the point of view 
uh, of our international partners in relation to the threat of terrorism and violent extremism in the country. Idris, sorry to interrupt if, if the volume, if, if you can increase okay. the volume. Okay, I think Perfect. my microphone was up and I do apologize. I hope you got at least uh, understood what I said previously. Thank you. But, uh, as I was saying, we're very privileged to have this partnership and we'll continue to engage more with our member states jointly to ensure that we respond positively to their expectations. Uh, but also we look forward to a full engagement uh, from the participants to enlighten us, guide us uh, and give us you know, the material upon which we can base our future programs. So we're very uh, looking forward to these four, four uh, weeks um, that will be quite engaging. So thank you very much uh, without a further ado. And I do hope that, you know, my pre <laughs> the message at the beginning was clear. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Idris. <clears throat> it's really a pleasure again to, to, uh, to partner uh, with, with Kairat and, <clears throat> and to work with you. Uh, so let me just do an overview of the of the program, <laughs> really quick. Uh, why why are we having this this program? Um, an appreciable number of, of African countries, um, you know, they have developed strategies to prevent and counter violent extremism, and these strategies they hold you know great potential as they allow for the setting of priorities, determination of targets the allocation of financial, you know, human, <clears throat> technical resources, as well as the provision of greater coherence and coordination among and between a range of governmental and non-governmental stakeholders um, as they strive to attain strategic objectives to address, you know, the drivers of violent extremism <clears throat> in their domestic and or, you know, regional context. But what you know, we, we have seen and what studies have demonstrated is that a common pitfall of these strategies, however, is that they do not often align with the nuances of local contexts, you know, with the domestic causal factors associated with violent extremism. So the result in, uh, in some cases is a gap between uh, national governments who control you know, national uh, PCVE strategies and local authorities that are generally more socio-culturally attuned to their communities' uh, attributes, uh, needs, and dynamics. <clears throat> so the persistence of barriers to collaboration compounds the lack of understanding between national and local actors, between government and non-governmental actors, you know, between law enforcement and local communities. And this frankly deprives countries of leveraging the comparative advantages that these different level of actors um, can bring to the design and to the implementation of CVE uh, strategies, countering violent extremism programs, strategies, and initiatives. So addressing these concerns uh, and shortcomings you know, is, is critical for improving the existing CVE strategies and programs <laughs> in line, obviously, with the validity of the processes, empirical evidence that led to their development and, and adaptation. And international guidance and, and good and emerging good practices, as we will hear later on, Idris <clears throat> and Angel, you know, emerging practices from within the African continent all point to the necessity of bridging that void between the national and the local. <clears throat> because after all, as we all know, the violent extremist challenges that national uh, actors and strategies seek to address, you know, are local for the most part, which make it imperative to localize the CVE strategies, ensuring in the process that national government plans are informed by local practice and perspectives, and that local action in turn is in line with national, uh, <coughs> with national frameworks. So such an approach recognizes the critical role that local governments, you know, that grassroots civil society actors, stakeholders, they can play in helping design and implement multi-agency, 
um, a multi-stakeholder approaches, plans, and strategies <coughs> to counter violent extremism. And such an importance is seen in the growing number of subnational governments and cities that are <coughs> developing local action plans to address violent extremism. And local action plans, or CVE uh, uh, strategies, local strategies, they provide an opportunity, as one scholar put it, to decentralize their approach in tackling challenges that are often community-specific. They also provide an avenue uh, for local governments to utilize, <clears throat> as you will uh, see here and read, in the, in the literature that we have included in the service, um, is that they allow local governments to utilize their convenient power uh, by mainstreaming CVE activities into broader development plans and by adopting, um, as, as, as will be stated in, in the toolkit we assigned for, uh, for today and tomorrow's reading, you know, a whole of city approach. And these plans should flow from, obviously, and be consistent with the national framework. So localized approaches to countering violent extremism are therefore the backbone of state efforts to tackle the underlying drivers of this phenomenon of violent extremism. Yet, the knowledge on how national CVE strategies are translated into actions at the local level is still limited. <laughs> to date, uh, we have little insight into how cooperative and coordinated efforts between and among government actors and non-governmental actors are established and how they are integrated into national and local CVE strategies or, or action uh, plans. There are still distinctive gaps there, <laughs> gaps into how relevant government agencies like national security committees, like the police, like ministries of the interior, labor, education, just to name a few, you know, how these relevant government agencies and non-governmental actors, they are integrated into the stages of conceptualizing, developing, implementing, and monitoring CVE activities and programs. And gaps also remain in understanding how local action plans to CVE are planned, how they are designed, and how they are implemented. <clears throat> Sorry, there are not many countries around the world, especially in, in the global south, and obviously in our continent, the African continent, that have developed these subnational plans. In Africa, Besides Kenya, which has the most extensive local action plans, only a handful of countries have developed policies or strategies which encompass some elements of local action plans. And these local action plans, they necessitate engagement with a number of stakeholders across multiple levels. So understanding how these actors interact within a specific framework, understanding the roles that they play in achieving a shared goal is key to the development of sustainable CVE capacity building at the local level. Um, and the importance of having, of developing and implementing localized approaches to current politics is, is why we're having this joint academic program today. The program builds on the work of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, that the African Union Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism, CAIRT, you know, has been doing in working with, 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 with African security officials, policymakers, and practitioners you know, to develop, to refine, and to implement more effective and inclusive CVE frameworks and strategies that are better suited to local realities. So <laughs> the program objectives is that, you know, we want you and all of us obviously to have a greater understanding of the basic principles and practices that guide the development of local uh, CVE action plans. 
We want participants to have new insights into how to enhance national, local cooperation and how to implement locally driven strategies and programming to counter environmental extremism. We want participants to have a greater understanding of the role that collaborative security arrangements between security forces, local government officials, community leaders play in the design and implementation of local action plans to counter about extreme. So we are really privileged to have an impressive list of participants. I mean, that hail from some 44 countries and organizations in the African continent. There are about you know, 120 of you with really impressive resume, impressive credentials that make you truly the best and brightest in your countries and in the African uh, and a continent. So, so we're really privileged to, to have uh, distinguished colleagues like you during this, these four weeks. <clears throat> the academic approach, as, 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 as my director said, uh, Sir Hampton, this four week long virtual program, you know, assemble senior professionals for a frank, for an open dialogue with experts and among participants in a non-attribution environment, meaning specific comments or intervention by any participants will not be identified by name or country. In any summaries, in any reports, in any sharing of insights gained from the program by any participant, speaker, or the organizers. <clears throat> so the engagement, as I said earlier, will be conducted in English, French, and Portuguese, and will be divided into four modules that offer a mix of plenary sessions like the one we're having today and in-depth group discussions like the one we'll be having tomorrow <clears throat> for peer learning and sharing of experiences. Uh, each module will be comprised of one live panel per week, per week like today, 90 minutes total, with Q&A moderated by me or by Kairos, acting director, Ramali, and four discussion groups. So the program will be composed of four plenary sessions. Uh, the first one is today's, understanding the rationale for local CVE action plans. Uh, the second one is designing and drafting a local CVE action plan. The third one is how to implement you know, a local CVE uh, action plan. We want to understand how local CVE action plans, they define responsibilities in their implementation. We want to explain the different funding streams. How do you fund these local action plans? And then we want to see some of the challenges during the implementation of these local action plans. <clears throat> and the last and fourth and last session is challenges and lessons learned from the Kenyan County Action Plan model. And why Kenya? It's only one of the it's one of the only countries in the world, uh, as as you will read in that toolkit assigned today, which has national government mandated local action plans, and it has accompanying local coordination mechanisms and structures. So there are a lot of innovations <coughs> in the country, uh, and these innovations they have made the Kenyan model an emerging practice in localized program the implementation of these action plans, local action plans, or county action plan, has been plagued by several challenges, however. So we want to learn from these challenges, from the, to get insights, you know, from <clears throat> how these local action plans were designed and the challenges that they confronted and then how to overcome them, right? Um, the, the syllabus, the syllabus, provides an overview of academic goals and key policy questions related to the development and implementation of local action plans in the context of power and violent extremism. So as you will see, <coughs> uh, for each session, we provide um, a brief background, introduction, and then a list of questions for discussions. Uh, we also include selected articles. And in this case, there is a toolkit extremely important, uh, uh, whose primary purpose is to help frame the issues within the context of available scholarship and policy uh, documents. <clears throat> so in preparing for this program, we want you to obviously read the syllabus, which we know you will, 
We want you to read some or all of the recommended readings. We want you to spend some time thinking about and answering those discussion questions, especially for tomorrow for you know, discussion groups. So consider what experiences from your work might be relevant to share in discussion groups. Um, so please be prepared to actively you know, participate, <coughs> obviously in these plenary sessions through the Q&A, but also in the discussion groups, because we want to learn from participants, learn from each other. Uh, the discussion groups is where we discuss what we read in the readings, what was presented in the plenary, and again, this is where we share you know, experiences, insights, practices, and lessons among ourselves. So with that, we will <coughs> start our um, uh, first plenary session, <coughs> the understanding the rationale for local CVE action plans. And uh, we are privileged again to have uh, two distinguished uh, <coughs> speakers with us, uh, Idris Lali, that, uh, that my director has uh, introduced, and a uh, friend, colleague, and he's truly one of the best and brightest minds in the, in the fields of, of CT uh, and, and, and CVE, uh, uh, well recognized, uh, well respected. So uh, uh, I've learned a lot from this, so it's, it's a pleasure. <laughs> to have, uh, have Idris as a partner, but obviously as, as, as a speaker here, here with us. So. And then uh, Angela Martin. Uh, again, it's a, it's a colleague. Uh, frankly, I see her as, as a mentor, you know, always try to uh, conceptualization of programs to, to balance ideas off uh, uh, with her. Uh, uh, she's, she's the senior counterterrorism advisor at uh, USAID's Africa Bureau, and she brings over 30 years of experience designing, managing, implementing programs for the U.S. government agencies, such as USAID, <coughs> uh, African Development Foundation, the Peace Corps, has significant field experience in West, Central, uh, Southern Africa, and also the Balkans. And she's a senior manager and policy advisor with extensive experience, again, developing and applying policy decisions to assure <coughs> the successful implementation of field-level projects. Uh, she led all the aspects of the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership Program, Startup for USA, and has led numerous field-based assessments of violent extremism risk in Sub-Saharan Africa. And she directed the USAID Africa Bureau Development of Technical Guides, which serve as the foundation for all uh, development assistance programs to current violent extremism. She has created and delivered training based uh, upon the technical guides to nearly 200 uh, practitioners in, <coughs> in 10 countries. Uh, and, and frankly, the list goes on and on. And it's, uh, so I'll have to, to stop here, Angela. Uh, <coughs> sorry. All right. Let's start with, with Idris. Uh, Idris, as, as we said, several African countries, they have developed and are in the process of developing strategies to prevent and counter violent extremism. And you have been engaged in, in these yourself. But in spite of these strategies, however, Notable progress in addressing the challenge of violent extremism and terrorism is still lacking uh, in many parts of, of the continent. So the question is, is why, obviously. And some critics point out that some of these strategies remain mere paper exercises, or they rely on template approaches, <clears throat> which do not necessarily align with the nuances of their specific country context or the actual causal factors of violent extremism. Others, they point to existing gaps uh, within national governments in understanding the systems, structures, processes necessary to rectify the often weak cooperation among the different levels of actors, national, local, and other stakeholder groups like civil society, et cetera, and civil. So, I mean, all these critiques, they suggest that such strategies, you know, hold little practical value and are unlikely to be implemented. So first, you know, based on, on your experience, again, you've worked on a lot of these, 
are these concerns uh, are these concerns justified? Uh, thank you, Anwar. Uh, thank you. Indeed, um, you know, many African countries have developed or are in the process of developing uh, PCVE or CT strategies and associated plan of actions. But um, as you correctly indicated, um, you know, the concerns are quite justified. Uh, and I think, you know, if allow me, I'll go through the reasons why these are justified before, you know, pinpointing uh, some of the challenges that are faced around uh, along the way. Um, I mean, many of these strategies are indeed uh, paper strategies, so ink on paper. Uh, they do not respond or reflect the true realities on the ground. Um, they are strategies that have been developed in compliance. You know, the United Nations counterterrorism, global counterterrorism strategy of 2006 required regions and member states to have such a document in place. Um, and uh, many of these countries were eager uh, to uh, develop a, a strategy based on that template that was provided by the UN. Some others were consulting, I think with Google nowadays, you can just Google, you know, national strategy and pick and choose. You had the Dutch strategy. Many of them have uh, basically cut and paste the Dutch strategy, the British strategy, the US strategy at some point, and the, uh, and the French strategy. And basically, it was just a cut and paste exercise um, whereby members said um, we're seeking not only compliance with the UN, but sometimes responding to partner and technical assistance uh, providers' conditions um, for funding and for support. Um, in that sense, you know, many of these member states uh, just went on there and, and started the process. Uh, initially, they did not understand what the shape or format of the strategy entailed, uh, what should be included in the strategy. Is it part and parcel of the national security strategy? Is it a standalone strategy? Um, and as you can imagine, uh, um, you know, this made many uh, make mistakes, whereby they are, as uh, we are speaking, uh, reviewing the structure, the strategies, and the associated plan of actions. Um, other, I would say, um, examples of why this had been, I would say, badly managed uh, or prepared or developed is many of the countries um, were taken, I would say, by surprise. And the leadership in the country required them, usually the president or the minister of security, requiring them to have a strategic document that will lead and coordinate all national action. So it is in response to a present, persistent uh, counterterrorism threat. So once the threat has emerged, once the threat has progressed, and then realizing that they were not making any headway or progress in countering the threat, they uh, took it upon them now, upon a decision to have a strategy in place. Again, that strategy mostly would be one-sided in a sense that it will respond to the security aspect. So they are mainly security-centric or law enforcement-centric strategies that do not necessarily take into consideration the factors that have led already to the threat, the progression of the threat, or factors that are conducive uh, to terrorism in many of, uh, of the cases, which, as you can imagine, uh, obviously will have one-sided stakeholders. This will be law enforcement, military, intelligence um, stakeholders, not necessarily civilian stakeholders, not necessarily civil society organizations um, in that sense. So little consultation would be uh, required in that sense uh, because, you know, the countries are trying to respond to that urgent security uh, threat. Uh, another major challenge, uh, I would say, again, is the confusion that we're creating at the international level. You remember, Anwar, we had so many, in so many occasions, talked about the t terminology, the additional obligations that we're setting on member states, the confusion we're creating at the international level. Initially, we requested them to develop counterterrorism strategies. Then we went on and started talking about countering violent extremism. So what's the difference in that sense? What are the requirements? What should we have in the document or the framework document at the national or regional levels? And then you add to that preventing violent extremism. Um, in particular, as the United Nations uh, Security, I uh, would say, Secretary General Plan of Action on violent, uh, on preventing violent extremism, added another layer of complication because member states were at loss. Should we have in place a plan of action to implement the counterterrorism strategy, or should we have another one or separate document which is preventing violent extremism? So this added a 
you know, to the confusion and the challenges that were at the level of the member states, not only in terms of translating the requirements and obligations into a comprehensive document, but also in terms of identifying which stakeholders are, are, are needed to be consulted at the national level and which stakeholders are, um, would, I would say, responsible for the implementation of these uh, framework documents. So I, I think these are, at least from our own perspective and the interaction we had with uh, a number of member states, I would say that CAIRT is assisting at least a dozen or more member states in developing the counter-terrorism strategy. And we see that these challenges are recurring in all the member states that we have visited. And I think some clarity need to be brought up to them in order to, um, to to assist them in having, as you said, something which is aligned to local context, something which is reflects their local priorities, uh, but also the threat they're facing at the level of the threat, but also, you know, grow uh, in, in terms of perspective and views in including not security um, and non-governmental stake actors because they are uh, much more closer uh, to the communities in which, uh, you know, these uh, these strategies or plans of actions are uh, aiming to uh, to serve and 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 to take into account. So over to you, Anwar. Without uh, you know. Excellent. No, th thanks. thank you, Idris. So 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 given these uh, you know challenges and, and hurdles and uh, uh, problems with these with these strategies, uh, would you share with participants you know the the, the key elements of good. Um, and bad practices, which, which you already outlined, but the good practices of these strategies that empower, you know, the, the role of, of local governments. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, uh, indeed, I think I only talked about the challenges, but in terms of good practices, um, our own experience has shown that, um, you know, whichever lead agency uh, which is tasked initially to take a lead on the development of uh, of the strategy and of, uh, of plan of action, that lead agency has to accept at one point or another, the leadership in terms of implementation will not necessarily be at its level. Uh, meaning that they have to realize that this is a multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-actor um, initiative uh, and exercise uh, in which um, uh, multi-sectors of, uh, of, of the government, but also multi-actors of society that needs to be involved in the process of not only the conceptualization of the development of the strategy and a plan of action, but also in terms of the implementation. And this should be cascaded from, I would say, driven bottom up, but also, um, I would say, supervised from the top to the bottom to ensure that there is um, national coordination, uh, national, I would say, orientation, uh, dedicated and sustainable funding uh, coming from the top. And that would be the role of the government because the United Nations counterterrorism strategy requires member states and governments to take the lead on terrorism, on countering terrorism, but for local actors to be involved in the um, in devising local um, uh, local plans of actions. I think one good example, uh, not for example, I think my advice if, um, you know, we put and set aside, and I'm glad that you put in the reading material, the GCT of good practices, I will not go through through all of them. They're all viable. They're all verifiable, I would say, and very, um, very helpful. But I think there are three or four activities or actions that member states need to take into account. First of all is stakeholder mapping. It's quite important. And uh, and, and as I said, you know, keep an open mind uh, in terms of going beyond government, beyond security, but also realize that the stakeholders that we are maybe engaging in uh, consulting at the beginning are not necessarily, um, you know, that list is not exhaustive. It will grow as uh, needs are identified, but also as we put into the practice, a practice the strategy and the implementation of the plan of action. The second aspect would be the necessity, once you identify the stakeholders, is to have a national consultation with individu individual stakeholders to understand their point of view, to understand their interpretation uh, the, uh, and identification of priorities, uh, to understand their roles that they can play at a later stage, but also to obtain some kind of ownership 
uh, of, of the process itself. Once you do the individual consultation, um, and we've always carried that out as Kaya, it is to organize what we call a national dialogue, uh, whereby you bring all national stakeholders together to discuss the importance of the strategy, to discuss the pillars of the strategy and agree on those pillars uh, collectively, and but also to identify actions and responsibilities of individual uh, stakeholders. Um, that will definitely you know ensure that there is collective ownership um, i would say representation and inclusiveness across the board uh, we have to understand that the strategy itself could be a national document but the plans of actions have to be calibrated to respond to national uh, sorry local uh, drivers and factors that could lead to terrorism uh, and this is why it's it's very important to ensure that all um, I, I would say the uh, the interpretation uh, of the national strategy or the national plan of action has to be cascaded down to the local authorities, including civil society organizations, women, youth, elders, community leaders, in order to identify what are their priorities, what could be their roles and responsibilities, and then uh, how that could uh, uh, be implemented uh, locally. So for me, it's quite important to have the dialogue. The mapping exercise is quite important. The threat assessment and risk assessment, which is done locally, is quite important, uh, but also identifying available resources, actors, and then try to develop a program that is auto-sustained. And it's quite important because the other aspect which will make it work or fail is basically the financing or the financial aspects that are linked to the uh, implementation of the strategy. I hope this answers uh, your question, Anwar. Absolutely, Idris. Absolutely. Um, and these good practices that, that you outlined, again, understand uh, and uh, underscore the importance of uh, national you know, CVE uh, frameworks to reflect local perspectives and, and priorities, and, and then you know that such frameworks are implemented effectively on on the ground. They need to recognize the need to understand the threats uh, and the challenges of violent extremism at both national and, and local uh, and local levels. So we need to identify, to delineate, and to respect the comparative advantages of different levels of CVE. Uh, uh, actors, you need to, as, as, as you laid out, develop an inclusive national CBE framework uh, that reflects the perspectives of this diversity of actors. That's why the mapping <coughs> part is, is extremely uh, important here. Um, you need to promote effective coordination, communication, collaboration among national and local stakeholders uh, relevant to the design and implementation, obviously, of these uh, uh, action plans. And then how you know, to balance uh, uh, you know, national leadership and, and local ownership. So that takes us to the <clears throat> third question, uh, Idris. You know, CAIRT, which, which you lead and, and others, they have recognized, as you stated, that effective cooperation between governments and, and local actors is essential ingredient in sustained uh, development, but also implementation of these CVE strategies, you know, policies, plans, or programs. But, but there are still barriers out there to trust, to information sharing, to, to collaboration that impede the effective implementation. So I'll push you even, even further, and, and you addressed uh, <coughs> some of it, obviously. Uh, are there any promising you know, approaches and lessons learned from these nationally centered CVE strategies to develop local CVE action plans, obviously as mechanisms for effective implementation of strategies? So if you can provide some, some examples, uh, that, that would be good. Mm, thank you. That's a, a very important question indeed. It's, it's bringing the, the whole question to home, closer to home. Indeed, as you indicated in your opening remarks, I think Kenya, um, uh, to a lesser extent, I think Nigeria, are good examples of how uh, PVE and C PCVE strategies were devised and implemented at the local level. However, let me share with you some of our experience with Burkina Faso, uh, Lesotho, Namibia, um, I think Botswana, as we speak 
Mexique, DRC, and Côte d'Ivoire, which was quite um, important and revealing. As I said earlier, you know, usually it's the intelligence community or the intelligence agency that will take the lead or the Ministry of Security. And then uh, following consultation uh, within, uh, but also with the organizations such as Kayak and other organizations, I think they came to realize that it has to go beyond the security centric. And this is quite important. In the outset, I think all participants have to realize that, you know, in order to successfully and sustainably counter violent extremism is, is, is to ensure that its root causes, uh, the, um, the um, I would say, the grievances upon which the extremists are recruiting new members. Uh, but also are able to entrench themselves in communities have to be addressed. Uh, in that sense, there is a need to understand not only national threat, but to understand the national dynamics, local grievances that could give rise, or could be exploited by violent extremism to recruit more, uh, by the, uh, you know, uh, buy into the communities um, and, and ensure that they are well entrenched in those communities and, and it draw to date more of our youth, women, uh, into their uh, rhetoric and into their, you know, uh, I would say, uh, utopic, uh, utopic views uh, of the world and it will, uh, interpretation of the world. So it's quite important uh, in that sense that, you know, from a national point of view, if we're developing strategies, we need to ensure that those strategies are in tune with local conditions, local context, uh, but also include local owned initiatives and, and, and programs, uh, you know, even in those communities that have been exposed heavily to, I would say, radical elements of violent extremism, there are individuals, there are groupings, there are, um, I would say, civil society organizations that are resilient and they are providing solutions and trying to address the local conditions or the local factors that are leading uh, to more violence in those communities. So it's quite important to look at the threat from the perspective of those communities that are exposed, but also try to find solutions within the communities. Uh, let's not forget those communities um, by force or, or uh, you know, uh, by, uh, by the conditions they're living in have developed a capacity of resilience. So we want to understand that capacity of resilience, which does not cost the governments any money uh, because they, these are community-led initiatives, right? And they don't rely on government support or uh, government financing. And how these communities were able to develop these resilience um, initiatives or resilient programs, initiatives, uh, and, and create these barriers that uh, allow them to be immune to radical elements or extremist movements and so on and so forth, and see how can that be extra extrapolated towards the whole, I would say, region. Um, what I like about, uh, as, as I told you earlier about your approach, is that we are moving gradually from a whole of government, whole of society approach to a more whole of city approach. And I like that. I told you, I congratulate you for that terminology used, because it's quite important to look at the problem from within the city, but also identify the solutions from the within the city itself. And I think Kenya has been very good in that. Algeria has done that, but as part of a national program. There isn't, as I told you, any clear document that says, okay, each municipality. It has become, I would say... Uh, this is how we do business. Any ministry, any system for civil society, they've always, they all have been sensitized that they take into consideration these aspects without really, uh, you know, having uh, to be guided by a, a framework document that says we clearly that we have to fight violent extremism. On the contrary, um, this has been so decentralized that you have what we call local coordination committees or local security committees uh, that are looking at the threat, at the, um, I would say, the challenges from a local perspective, but also proposing solutions from a regional, a local perspective. Uh, obviously, this is cascaded upwards towards, you know, uh, the, 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 the central authorities uh, to keep an eye, provide the support, the funding, and so on and so forth. But the problems are identified locally. The problems as, uh, of uh, the solutions to these problems are also proposed uh, locally. So you have the buying, the ownership, but also 
communities, as you said, the problem of the trust. If we are addressing the first challenges and, uh, 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 and difficulties that the communities are facing, then through addressing these um, priorities that they have themselves identified, you build trust between you and the communities. You ensure uh, that the communities view you uh, or view the, the government, I would say, and institutions as, 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 as being caretakers not as, as being oppressors, uh, because as I told you in many of our meetings, that mostly in, in some of these secluded and alienated communities, the interaction would be through the military or some kind of law enforcement, but not necessarily in terms of provision of services. So if we are able to project ourselves and be able to project that we're here to serve and protect, then the trust is really gained and the communities will be forthcoming and, and play an increasing important role in preventing uh, violent extremism, identifying, uh, I would say, rogue elements, uh, but also contributing to putting in place uh, or implementing uh, any uh, solutions that are proposed to them at the local level. Uh, over to you, uh, Anwar. <coughs> Excellent, thank you, uh, Idris. And, and I like that whole of city approach uh, uh, as well. And I invite the participants again to, to refer to the to that toolkit by Patricia Grosby and Dominic Kalia. And we have them as speakers, you know, in session two and three, developing and implementing local action plans, in which they uh, go into greater depth. Uh, explaining what that entails. Um, uh, now I'll turn to to um, to you, Angela. <laughs> I mean, as, as you've heard, Idris has provided, I think, uh, great insights uh, into uh, how national frameworks could be valuable in setting the groundwork through which, you know, these local action plans or programs can be developed. Um, at present, uh, local action plans have been developed in only a small number of countries, as you heard Idris talk about Kenya, slightly uh, less in, in Nigeria. Uh, <coughs> um, yet they provide an, an avenue <coughs> through which <coughs> countries can decentralize their approach towards addressing violent extremism. Um, they provide avenue for countries to work more <coughs> you know, effectively with community-based actors to address those specific challenges that Idris laid out <coughs> uh, with violent extremism, associated with violent extremism uh, to the local context. So, <clears throat> yes, despite this recognition, <clears throat> there is still a disconnect between national level policymaking and local action. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so national governments, as Idris stated, they have dominated security agendas. And PCVE strategies have often overlooked the role of uh, local governments, even if you know uh, city administrators, municipal level practitioners, and other local authorities are generally more socio-culturally attuned to their communities' attributes and dynamics. So, <clears throat> based on uh, on your long experience, you know, working on on this, to what level? have these strategies overlooked the role of local governments and its impact in the implementation of these strategies? And if you can provide some, sure. some examples, that would be helpful. Angel? Great. Thanks. And, and thanks. Uh, again, one, I just want to thank you for the invitation. As, as maybe was noted, uh, Director Dries and I first started out in this area way back in 2006. That was my first ACSS event. Um, back in Algiers, and I think he had just started his own so work in this field. And so we've had 15 years now to watch the evolution of this. And, and I will note that back when we started, the term CVE did not exist then. We used CT and we used CE, counter-extremism, right? We added the violent a little bit later. So it, it's it's been quite an evolution, and I think this is part of the process of continuing to have these discussions. Now we have, you know, back then, the number of practitioners that are participating in this event didn't exist, right, with the vocabulary and the knowledge and the experience to contribute to this. So it's really changed in the last 15 years. I do a little bit of housekeeping. I just want to note that my remarks are my own. They're not USAID's or USG policy. I have to say that before any of these things like this. Um, 
So to start off, I'm going to take a step, uh, you know, sort of repeat a little bit of looking at what a national strategy is supposed to do. Right. What what are some of the elements that actually are part of it and 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 how we can use that for for working the next level? And, and the Nigeria one in 2017 is actually not I think it's a reasonably uh, good example that that's common to others. And and so the the national plans are not supposed to be operational at the local level. Right. That's not their intent. But some of the things they have in there is they will reference whether it's statutes or authorities, whether they're uh, international ones or uh, in their own country, that justifies or gives them the, the recourse to actually have this plan to address this problem. So it sort of gives that underpinning and foundation, which is important in a bureaucracy. It can highlight the best practices. It might um, even be a little directive saying, <clears throat> you know, uh, please follow do no harm principles. Please make sure that you're considering human rights when you're implementing these plans. It might be more directive about a demographic saying, you know, we should be focusing these plans, these actions should focus on youth. They should be inclusive of women or take gender into account. Uh, they will often highlight the key ministries or agencies that should be involved beyond the security services, and they almost always mention civil society. So in the broad framework, it does set out these parameters. It often will this, uh, lay out a process. There should be consultations, or this should be inclusive, or it should be based upon uh, trust building. And it might even, some of the better ones, have metrics of progress, but the progress isn't about <clears throat> reducing the terrorist threat, or doing preventive, it's usually progress about the number of agencies that have their own plans or whether this has been uh, applied at the local level or is there progress on on the number sort of on the on the process of actually developing the plan and applying it. So so there are limitations, but they're built into it. I mean, a national plan can only go so far. So 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 it's not necessarily even the cookie cutter ones had some value, I would say. They weren't wrong. They just uh, could only go so far by their nature. Right. I think the other thing is, um, you know, it, it will also what it did do is pulled CV and CT out of the shadows. When we first started or even in countries where these are new, the idea of there is a terrorist threat or we're even going to engage in this area created a great deal of suspicion, could create, um, uh, uh, in the worst case, targeting of certain groups or certain religions. So having this even as a public dialogue, again, has some value, that there was a public document related to this because it really did pull it out of the shadows. Um, and, and again, you know, cookie cutters are bad, but it does imply – an overall conformity to so some basic precepts of the approach, the idea of it was integrated, that it was holistic, that prevention, it went from being a CT to CTCVE to PCVE. Again, this progression, and a lot of it does, uh, the global counterterrorism forms, um, uh, materials that you're going to be reading, part of why that was established back in 2012, I believe, was to make sure that the governments themselves, in principle, agreed to some guidelines about how CT or CVE was done. So you were not um, doing actions that in the name of security, you are countering the rights of, of individuals in your own country for whatever reason, right? So, so, so there was some value at these higher orders. It is a little bit sort of uh, higher level, they say 35,000 foot, but it's a necessary component to get these actions to work. Um, one of the other challenges that was touched upon is most of these were developed in response to a security problem. So it's led by security actors. And even with this acknowledgement of it needs to have other ministries involved um, and other and, and the importance of, of prevention side and dealing with economic and other drivers, they're still coordinated by maybe the Ministry of Interior or in the National Counterterrorism Center, which was created in, in Kenya. We have our own in, in the U.S. It's still coordinated by a security agency because it's a security response. Ultimately, it's a security problem. And, you know, one of the even in the best cases for someone like myself, who's a development practitioner, it's we don't know how to talk to each other. 
I just spent uh, last last fall, I spent two months at AFRICOM working with my colleagues there as a liaison for for USAID. And we have a different culture. All right. They follow orders. USAID, we do not follow <laughs> orders. I mean, development agencies, it's more of a dialogue. We, we come to consensus when we agree on an action. And I think this is replicated in, in different ministries and different ways people operate, even at the community level. So this is a challenge, right, and how we actually understand what is a strategy supposed to do for us. Um, another thing that, you know, I think is a little more nuanced is at the very beginning from, you know, based upon common sense, this, the security actors and even the, the development actors that were brought in early to help develop these plans understood that civil society, you know, we, civil society was key, right? That they had the ability to reach people who were at risk, who were vulnerable, or deal with the sensitive topic of countering terrorism, countering violent extremism, reaching out, preventing people from being radicalized. Um, and so that was sort of more of a common sense logic approach, but we kind of skipped over local authorities. We went straight from national security to civil society organizations. And part of this was that's who we worked with. It's easier to give a grant to them. It's easier to 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 direct their activities or, or coach them or train them. It's much more complicated working with our government counterparts. So we kind of glossed over the local authorities and local governments ourselves, the donors, you know, and we didn't start even highlighting that until maybe five or six years into this into this area, working in this scale area. And what did we miss? So, um, you know, for the missed opportunities with local authorities is connecting different regions, right? We they're the ones who are really going to be better able to connect to counterparts in a different province or even a different city or even a different neighborhood if we go to that level, right? Um, civil society organizations generally are not going to have that kind of connectivity and reach if you're just going straight to them. Um, they can bring things to scale, again, sort of related to that. You might have a good model at a very localized level with a civil society organization. How do you bring it up? How do you replicate that? How do you uh, expand that? That's not going to come from others. Generally, it's much harder for civil society organizations to do that spread. Yes, you have platforms, you have the umbrella organizations, but they still work normally in their very narrow level of expertise, right? Um, to provide oversight and encouragement. The government can be seen as a neutral partner in that sense and not a competitor with other civil society organizations. Uh, so, so all of those things are missing when you're working at the most local level. And so having them part of a planning process and implementation process is something that we're starting to sort of catch up on and trying to backfill, I will say, almost in this process. And so I have an example that's fairly recent of, of how this could work in a positive way. So there's a program um, in Somalia called TIS Plus, which just completed uh, – uh, in August of last year. And it's been going on. There was a TIS and a TIS Plus. So it's been going on for a while. It's evolved. And in their sort of a core approach is working with local authorities. And these are areas that are sort of the local authorities are just coming back or being reestablished in areas that have been uh, regained in Somalia to raise the stature of the local government, right, in those areas, is seen as being an integral part of the community. And they started doing some of the best practices and in-depth contextual analysis of, of what was going on in the key stakeholders, but also the perceptions of not only al-Shabaab, who they're countering, but the government, because they want to make sure they understand what do people think about local authorities and government to see how that can be improved because they have to be part of the solution. Um, and to project out not only service delivery, but security, because without security, you cannot do the service delivery. And, you know, and the result was, and a lot of it emphasized dialogues, a lot of it emphasized discussion. Yes, there were resources to do activities, but there were, but a lot of the emphasis was really just on communication, on, on making the presence and the availability of local authorities to the community for them to solve, uh, to build on the resilience as they had to, to highlight another the point that was made by by Idris. So I'll stop there, but that was a good example and we're going to follow up on it. I mean, I think it's something that's a model that's going to be not only the, you know, and again, it's not we, the USG is following up, but it's the government of Somalia and other donors are seeing that this is a a, a reasonable way to, to go forward to build on local resiliencies using local government uh, 
to um, to respond to the terrorist threat. So, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Angela. I think it, you have outlined this progression <clears throat> so nicely, uh, and 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 there is value. You're absolutely right. I mean, to these to these uh, to these strategies, and we start from CT to CVE to CVE. Uh, this concept of of a whole of society approach to emerge as the you know as the necessary next step really in in building these effective programs and and and, and strategies because it's widely recognized as you said that since violent extremism affects mm-hmm. you know uh, uh, several parts of of a society uh, from national governance through to communities and individuals so the solution must be uh, equally uh, total and progress has been has been made and it's good that you provided that example from uh, from from Somalia which uh, uh, we will we will highlight uh, uh, as we move we move forward so that takes me to the <clears throat> second question for you again based on on your experience and and you touched on it, obviously. What is the rationale for the role of local authorities in encountering violent extremism in terms of opportunities, but also challenges? And if you can highlight again some of the policy development, some of the innovative programs, like what you did with with Somalia, uh, that would be that, that would be great. Right. So the initiatives that are undertaken, obviously, at the local yeah. government. Right. Right. So, yeah. And so so I think one of the things and I will I will sort of pick up just to emphasize again, where I, you know, left off about CSOs being the preferred partners, but there's limitations because one of the other points and it's been touched on is that, you know, CVE or PCVE or whatever, it has security, justice and rule of law elements. There's no way around it. Right. This is not just a straight up. I mean, one could argue sometimes there's been attempts and I will talk about this to have it much more in in a purely what we would say development when one might argue service deliveries or non security actions. But the reality is that it is related directly to whether it's it's um, like I said, a rule of law, a justice side to even, you know, more direct security. And so civil society has limitations. Local government authorities, they're a broker between police and community. I've seen in some of the comments, and it's been in many reports, the provision of security and how it's done can be a driver as much as a response to uh, terrorist threats and terrorist actions in a community. And this is global. This is not um, limited to sub-Saharan Africa or North Africa or anywhere else, even in our own country, the the greater the threat, the greater the terror, usually the more severe the response, the more tolerance of being, frankly, aggressive to certain groups and certain individuals and certain people, um, and the more it costs in the long run. And it's a very hard thing. When people are scared, when a country is scared, we we allow our authorities to do things that that are challenging later on and how do you sort of move away from that right and and so so the, the local authorities definitely our bridge and being part of, you know, and it's been done and the examples I use are bottom up approaches that are not part of distinct plans or they're part of distinct plans for a specific problem versus a holistic um, uh, national strategy for that's been, you know, brought to the local level for CVE. And in part because Ultimately, the actions that are uh, you have to break it down to a point where you have to go to actions that usually are a little more narrow and not holistic. It's just too complicated. Right. And it's hard to have a discernible impact. And it's just too complicated for the actors doing this. So so, you know, um, but one of the other things is that. The, working with local authorities, and again, it's such that is they do have a specific identified role. So you can reference their role. A governor has a role as a governor or a prefet or a mayor that someone who's they may be well respected and well known, uh, civil society, an imam, a preacher, but it's still sort of a designated role versus that's earned and can change versus one that we people know what they're supposed to do. And I think that's helpful again sometimes when you need to have parameters parameters and need to know who you communicate to for whatever reason. And that's, again, where having these plans, but having the local authority involved really is, is filling a gap. And so one example is um, the reintegration process in Niger. 
right? And this is something, and my former job before I did this was I worked with the Office of Transition Initiatives, uh, which is part of USAID. And many of my programs back in the early 2000s were reintegration of ex-combatants in a number of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And reintegration of former uh, members of terrorist organizations is extremely complicated, le legally very challenging for everyone to work in. And we have not uh, really been able to handle it in a very significant way. It's still an ongoing challenge. So they had, it was uh, in in, uh, in the Lake Chad Basin in Niger, they had a national reintegration program. And um, the governor of DIFA was instrumental in really uh, – jump-starting that progress process, right? And and part of it was he was um, known and trusted in the community, but also he customized some of the approach to the local community. He, he was able to uh, set up a more localized process to vouch for, to, to guarantee that this person truly wants to be demobilized. He had enough of a connections to work with the communities that were receiving them. So even though there was a national plan, and they didn't really uh, articulate a written local plan of action to implement it. He was instrumental in being able to communicate, to, to really communicate what that plan should do in the local level and make it effective. And he also was able to report back to the national level and, and sort of let them understand what he was doing was consistent with the national program, even though it was sort of customized. You know, again, that's something that the local authority, so without it being written down, it really was what he was doing, was making a local action plan. And I think that's something that is essential and why the, having a local plan or some way that they can be implemented through local authorities really is effective. And even the evaluation of the program said working through not only the governor, but then they actually uh, – use uh, uh, other local authorities, it might have been like uh, Chef de Cartier's or other, other local authorities at the level, to really have them disseminate the reintegration plan and process because they could reach local uh, potential candidates for reintegration, whether it was self-demobilization or letting them know there was this process for you to join. And without that, it would not have been effective. So that was even the sort of the evaluation of the program. Um, another example, which is slightly different and, and, and uh, you know, it has a different aspect is, you know, Mauritania, which I'd worked on for uh, different times, they actually had a national plan way before anyone was doing this. They had it back in 2010, their first national plan. Um, and, and this is before UN even said that they worked in this area as far as, yes, you had uh, uh, the CT side, but the CV side didn't exist, right? They weren't working at it. But they had their strategy. And for them, their version of what CVE was, which frankly still tracks even to, these day, to this day in many countries, was looking at, um, for an Islamic Republic, religious instructions, so how madrasas and, and how were, were, were operating, but also education, how youth were getting economic opportunity and education. So that was sort of their take on where CVE fell. And 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 so what they did and where and and USA had several programs that worked with, frankly, um, offering vocational education and and economic opportunities to youth who were coming out of madrasas who might not have opportunities otherwise, and and what we found was that you know this was you know relatively uh, uh, clearly thought out and organized, but but but. If we did not work with the local authorities, with the prefet, what was one of the challenges? Well, these programs fell under at least four different ministries, right? Even in the best case, so you had the Ministry of Education. You had the Ministry of Religious Instruction. This is for Mauritania. You had the youth, and then you had an economic ministry that also touched on vocational education. And I would think end of the countries, you would have similar issues. So even if you're, you know, in the best case, you've done a good job, you have education or working with youth part of it or component, you have multiple ministries. And even in, even if it with good intentions, they have different reporting, they might have a different prioritization of their targeting of who should be first on the list to participate in these programs, whatever. And the local authority can help sort of calm the noise, right? and help sort of navigate that bureaucracy for implementation. 
so I'm just using that as another example of why if you don't have local authorities that have a voice and have standing, formal standing with those different ministries, it's going to be a little harder to actually put into operation some of these programs and also to capture the effect to make those connections. So those are the two examples I have for that one. <coughs> ah, wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> Angela, uh, you're, you're ab absolutely right. That's why I mean, any national plan or any approach, uh, you know, it should really uh, have, should build in flexibility in it. Mm -hmm. As, as you, you nicely uh, outlined in, in the Niger case, to allow these local actors, in this case the governor, right, to use their, uh, their authority, their respect, their proximity, you know, to, to address community-specific challenges while contributing to the overall framework. And you talked about the communication because it's a two-way street. It goes back to the national level. We explained that this is, in fact, you know, complementary. So that was... Wonderful. The second one from Mauritania is that whole of government uh, approach here, right? You have different ministries, and if you add to them the police, national security, so how do you coordinate and, and cooperate? And how local authorities here, <clears throat> you know, they have they have a role to uh, uh, to play. So th this is excellent. Thank you. And this brings us to the last uh, question. Question three is that. We know that a growing number of countries and cities are developing you know, strategies, initiatives to tackle violent extremism. Uh, and this highlights the important role of uh, uh, subnational governments, cities, municipalities, etc., you know, in their untapped potential, or the untapped potential for CBE. So again, can you share with the participant the lessons learned of how local action plans can convert this potential into reality? Uh, and can local action plans overcome the barriers between national and local authorities around CBE issues? Again, you address, uh, you know, some of this in, in question two, but if you can just elaborate just uh, right. briefly, that would be great. All right. So, um, so, so one of the other things that I think everyone, you know, who's participating in this understands is that this is all of these are not happening in a static environment. Right. You know, the, the areas that have problems, the countries that even though every country uh, may have their plan, the areas that um, where there's ongoing VEO uh, activities and challenges, they're fragile environments. They're often remote areas with limited government presence or a dense urban area with a large amount of criminal activity um, or border areas that have licit and illicit movement of trade, movement of people and goods. And so 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 the. Those areas have not been passively waiting for someone to come up with a plan to help them deal with their problems. It's sort of noted by Idris that you do the mapping, you look at what resilience already exists, you look at who the key actors are. And, and so what you're going to be doing is incorporating existing activities and existing programs. And a lot of them might be existing programs related to conflict mitigation, maybe youth engagement. There might be um, interfaith efforts. Um, you know, there's other sorts of things that are already existing, and you're going to leverage those. You're going to you're going to use that. And an example, I am going to use Kenya, but in a different way than <laughs> what you might think. So in Kenya, there was a program that went out, that's still ongoing, I believe, for years. We're looking at transit quarters. In Kenya, so transit with not only with Somalia but with, um, with Ethiopia um, and with Sudan, and and looking at those transit corridors because and how to manage conflict in those areas, right? And it was called peace, and there was a peace two, and there was a peace three, and um, and and we worked with it, and and then I think now it's been picked up by the well, the government of Kenya always is involved, and I think the EU now is also supporting it, and. And this was really a conflict mitigation program, and it helped communities set up structures related to uh, having ways to defuse tension and, and also communicate and bring in parts of the population to deal with what is inherently a – can be a volatile environment, border areas, right? And so the – and the program that was focusing on uh, the Somalia border, we built in um, – a border management program more deliberately. And so that brought in the uh, border agencies and really looking at how they can really, and they, and they worked with local governments across either side of the border. They found that they were able to communicate to really um, 
look at building trust between the government and communities as a way to uh, address extremist threats. So when they began to develop the action plans, this uh, the Peace 3 program worked with the government of Kenya to develop the Lamu County, uh, County Action Plan. And because of that, because they had the relationship with the local authorities, they had a relationship with most of the community organizations that would be involved, conflict mitigation, working with youth, working with people who've returned who were ex-combatants, right, in with al-Shabaab. And so they... Um, worked with developing the action plan, right? And and so that one actually in some ways was a much richer one. And Lamu County is a challenging one as we know, right? That is where there have been uh, uh, even even very recently attacks and actions with, with uh, against the Kenyan government by terrorist organizations. But one of the outcomes of having this, I would say a jumpstart, a really deep kind of engagement already in the community is that what they were able to do in the process of developing this action plan is they were able to restructure the community policing units in Lamo County to be more responsive. They had they focused in on trust building activities with the with the police and the communities. They had chiefs forums on CVE and the reconciliation process. And they worked on reconciliation and trauma, which is something that you know, you wouldn't have come out and, frankly, in some of the other county action plans, is something they might have done. But because of the work that was already happening there, they were able to build this into this process. And so I, I think the point being is that when you're looking at um, the, take the opportunity at the national level, just by design, you're going to have, frankly, a couple people like myself and others who work at the Capitol who are sort of in the room working on a piece of paper. <laughs> but but you at the when you're talking about the local level plans, you're going to be able to work with the existing uh, structures in the community, and it should be much more of a rich, interactive uh, foundation that really is built on real activities, real roles for people, and it should be paper capturing what's already going on in the community is what I would say, or at the county level. And I think that's one of the takeaways from this process that, and even I think when you get to, I may be jumping ahead to Kenya, you'll see the, the counties that have done I think have been a little more successful in their action plans are ones that already were able to build on existing activities that were relevant to this process. And I think that's where I will stop. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And again, thank you for the, the great example, uh, the transit corridor uh, uh, over there. Um, so this brings us to the, to, to the end of the moderated conversation.